good to see everybody here on this snowy Sunday in um, Chardon. I have to tell you that on the way in from Cleveland, there was no snow on the ground until we got out towards this way. And so it's all our snow melted in Cleveland and you guys still have. But you had like, what, 24 inches, I think I saw. 20, 28, 28 inches. So what's four inches here or there, right? So got uh, 28 inches. And so that's, um, I was going to say she's not here. I was going to say that's almost as tall as Margaret. She'll probably be watching this, so she'll see that. So almost as tall as Margaret, the, the snow was. So my, I, my message today is, um, I entitled it, The Reason for the Reason. And um, so I, wanna, I, I ran across a scripture um, that I had never connected to Christmas. I saw an online discussion about this and started looking closer at that scripture and I thought, wow, there, there really is a Christmas message in there. And so um, I'd like to share that with you today. But before we do, I have to tell you something that happened. So last night, um, I ordered French fries. And Gloria uh, asked me why they were called French fries when they weren't made in France. And I said, well, yeah, these, these French fries right here on my plate, originally, um, they're not, no, they're not made in France. But the original French fries were, and she said, well, everybody knows that French fries are made in Greece. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you are a good God. And we thank you for this time of year. We love the Christmas season because it reminds us so much of what you did for us and the sacrifice that you made for us to come and be with us. And so we thank you for that today. Ask that you would be with me as I bring this message, that you would pour out your anointing upon me. Lord, I pray for those that are here. I pray for those that are watching this at home today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are now officially um, in the Christmas season. What is it? December 6th, right? So we're in the Christmas season. And um, every year... Uh, I keep seeing people try to explain um, what Christmas is about. And, you know, we see things, there's always some kind of controversy that happens about people who are trying to secularize uh, Christmas, you know. I remember one year, uh, Starbucks, uh, for their Christmas cup, they just came out with a plain red cup. And everybody was upset because there wasn't any, it was just a plain red cup and there was no Christmas message on the cup. And some friends of mine, um, Ted and Sue Brust, who were pastoring in the area, they, I, I, I was making fun of that on um, Facebook. And um, some friends of mine, they went to Starbucks and got a cup. And, and for Christmas, they gave me, and they wrote John 3.16 on my, and I still have it. It's at home on my, it's at home on my desk. And so, but there are always these, these controversies, and, and, and we always try to figure out what Christmas really is about. And, you know, um, Gloria and I will watch those Hallmark movies, which if you've seen one, you know exactly what the storyline is. It's really funny because we actually go, now here's the part where they're, you know, about quarter till 15 minutes, last 15 minutes, they kind of break up and then, and then five minutes till they get back together. And, and part of the getting back together is always trying to come up with an explanation for what the Christmas season is. And they will say things like, it's about giving it's about family, it's about celebrating with friends, it's about being with people we love, and so on. And don't get me wrong, all those things are nice, right? We want to we wanna be part of those things, but they are, they are far from the real reason for Christmas. And, and then we also hear the saying, how many of you, I know everyone in this room has heard this saying, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? People have bumper stickers and there's signs about, and, and that's good too. But honestly, there is more to Christmas than Christmas just being the birthday of Jesus, okay? I mean, if that's all it was, we'd just have a birthday cake, sing happy birthday with Jesus and be done with it. But the meaning of Christmas really goes much, much deeper than that. Because after all, I mean, and it is a great, the story of Jesus' birth is a great story, isn't it? I mean, it's an awesome story. But truthfully, it's much more 
than that story that we read in the Bible. It's much more, it goes deeper than that. So yes, Jesus is the reason for the season, but there is a reason that he came. And that's why I entitled the message, The Reason for the Reason. There is a reason why Jesus came. And so I, as I was telling you, I found this discussion with some pastors online about a passage from the Bible, and it, it kind of stuck with me. Uh, I, I went to it and started reading it. And, and I don't know about you, but whenever I come across a scripture, uh, like if, I, if somebody says something about a scripture, I always like to go and read it, and then I like to read like the whole chapter that it's in. I kind of like to see what's around that verse. So I did that, and, and, and I found this scripture, at least for me, to be extremely powerful. There's, there's been times in my life where I've gone to a scripture that I should have known, that I wasn't real familiar with, but I should have known, and I didn't really, and then all of a sudden it just speaks to me, and it's almost life-changing in the perspective that it gives you. It's like, it's like one of the verses in Romans chapter 8 where it says, the same power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead is the same power that you and I, that dwells in us. That For me, that was life-changing because then I understood God wants me to succeed in the Christian life. And this verse is, is just about like that. I find it to be extremely powerful. But before we look in that passage, I want to look at one of the words from it because there's a word in this passage and, and, and it is a word that makes the connection between this verse and the Christmas season. And that word is manifest, okay? Manifest, all right? And so I looked it up in a dictionary and according to the Oxford Dictionary, the word manifest means clear or obvious to the eye or the mind. It's clear, ob it's an obvious thing. When something is manifested, it is obvious. It's clear. You understand what it, what it is. Um, it's, and it also says apparent, evident, unmistakable. And in the Bible, the word manifest is used many, many times in reference to a revealing. It is, the word manifest is a revealing. It reveals something to you. In fact, the entire book of Revelations is a manifesting of Jesus, okay? It is a revelation, a revealing, a manifestation of Jesus, and the word most associated with the book of Revelation is another word that you're familiar with, apocalypse. How many of you have heard that word apocalypse before? Which also means to reveal. The word apocalypse is the revealing of Jesus like when a curtain is pulled back slowly. Okay, so how many of you have ever been to a play or a musical and they open the curtain and it reveals everything that's behind it? That's that's what this word manifests. So when, I, when we talk about manifest, I want you to, in your mind, picture the opening of a curtain, and now you get to see what is behind that curtain, okay? So with that in mind, let's look at the passage that I've been talking about. It's 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, and it says this, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Okay, that's good, okay? Don't worry about that part. We're not going to worry about that part of the verse today. Here's the important part of this verse. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see that last part? He was manifested, the Son of God was manifested for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. So look at this. The Son of God was manifested. By the way, in, in the first two chapters, John always refers as Jesus as the Son. So when you, when you read 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 2, and 1 John chapter 3, until you get to verse 8, Jesus is always referred to as the Son. But when he gets to this verse, in verse 8, he calls him the Son of God. He uses that title. So John wanted us to make the connection with the baby in the manger, the Son of God, being manifested, being revealed. So when Jesus, the story of Christmas, the story of Christmas is a manifestation. It's a revealing 
of Jesus. It's, it's the opening, when you open the curtain, it's the opening scene of Jesus coming to be with us. Now before we go any further, let me take you back a few verses in that same chapter, 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So there's that word again, manifested, okay? He's revealed, okay? Let me, let me state verse 5 to you like this. I'm going to put it in my own words, okay? So it is obvious, if you read verse 5, here's what verse 5 is saying. Verse 5 says, it is obvious that Jesus came to take away our sins. Or you could say it like this, obviously Jesus came, the reason Jesus came was to take away our sins. That's pretty straightforward, right? Church, the reason for the season is not the birth of Jesus, it is that Jesus came to take away our sin. Jesus, Christmas, therefore, is not just about a birthday, but it is about the forgiveness of sin. Christmas is the reason that you and I can come to God and be forgiven of sin. Christmas is about Jesus coming to save us from our sin. Jesus said this about his own reason. He said this about himself, about why he came. It's from Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's us. We were lost. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Jesus came, in his own words, he came to save us. One of the greatest messages of the Christmas story is that it was Jesus who came to find us. He took the initiative. Church, it's always been God coming to us. When, when we first messed up, when Adam and Eve sinned, it was God who came into the garden and found Adam and Eve. It was God who sent his son to come and to save us from sin. In the end, it will be Jesus who will come to take us to heaven. And in the very end, it will be God who literally creates a new heaven and a new earth, and the throne of God will descend on the new earth, and that is where the residence of God will be, is on the new earth. It's always God coming to us. He's the one looking for us. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in appearance... As a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Jesus not only became human, but he even submitted himself to die. Here's the thing, God can't die. But Jesus chose not only to come, but he chose to lower himself so that he would be allowed to die. And not only that, if you read on in these passages, you will see that his humility didn't stop there. When he chose to die, he chose to die as a criminal. So not only did Jesus choose to come and die for us, but he chose to humble himself, not only to die, but to die as a criminal, a bad guy in the eyes of the government, a scandalous, terrible, painful, shameful, horrible death. A death that was humiliating. He was stripped of his clothes, spit on, punched, ridiculed. A crown of thorns was placed on his head, mocking his true position of who he really was. So Jesus, he died the death of a criminal. So Jesus was manifested, revealed, in order to save us. Isn't that good? That's what Christmas is about. When you say, what is Christmas about? And they go, oh, it's about giving. It's about family. It's about all these things. That's all well and good. But the real meaning of Christmas is that Jesus came to save us from our sins. But then we get to back to our original verse, verse 8. And we find the second reason that Jesus came. First John, I'm going to read that verse to you again. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why did he come? 
to save us, but also to destroy the works of the devil. You see, sin began with the devil. Right? It didn't begin with Adam and Eve. It began with Satan. And while we can't blame every time we sin on him, still the devil is the original sinner. And then in his hatred for God, he brought sin to God's creation. You see, the devil wants to damage and kill everything that God loves. And that includes you. He's working overtime to get you to fail in your walk with God. So here you are, you're trying to do everything you can to serve God. You're living the life, you're trying to live the life God wants you to, and the devil is working overtime to get you to fail. When I pastored in Michigan, had a young lady that started attending the church. And she just loved coming to church. And I remember it was a Wednesday night after Bible class, and I, I, I'm not sure what the subject was, but it was something about why do we come to church or something along those lines. And she said, Pastor, I want to tell you why I come to church. She goes, because we didn't talk about my reason for coming to church. And she said, I come to church because I am desperate to be here. I am desperate for Sunday. I am desperate for Wednesday because the rest of my life, I'm trying as hard as I can to be the person I know God wants me to be. And the only way I can manage to do that is by being here on Sunday and Wednesday. And she goes, every time I come to church, it's because I'm desperate to be here with God's people and to be with God and to hear the teaching that I need to hear. Isn't that incredible? That is an incredible story. Why? Because in her life, and he's doing it to all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. Some of us might, well, okay, I'm not that desperate to be there. But here's the thing. I want to tell you something. I don't care who you are. The devil is working overtime to get you to fail. He wants you to fail. He's there to tempt you. He's there to get you to fail. Let me show you one more thing the devil is up to. It's in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. This is uh, John talking, the same John who wrote our original verse. He says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. Now listen to this last part. For the accuser. Anybody know who the accuser is? The devil. The accuser of the brethren. I've thought about that in my own life. The Bible says the devil is the accuser. I've thought about how many times I've tried to make accusations at people and realizing when I do that, I'm behaving just like the devil. The accuser of the brethren who accused him before our God. Listen to this. Day and night. Day and night. He's in front of God. Look at Tom. Look at what he's doing. Look at what he's thinking about. Look at what he's looking at. Look at what he, where he's going. All those things. He's accusing us. See, not only is he tempting us to fail, he's doing everything he can to get us to fail, but then when we do fail, he runs to God to tattle about it. Look at him. Look at what he's doing. So right now, because this, this event that I just read you about, it says has is is been cast down. That's an event that's going to happen later on. But listen, right now, you want to know what the devil is doing right now? Right now, because he says day and night, who accused them before our God day and night. So right now the devil is constantly every day, every night, every minute of the day, he is standing before God ready to tell on you every time you fail. You don't have to worry about God seeing you because if God happens to miss it, the devil will tell him all about it. In the book of Job, the devil is called to stand before God and he's asked, where have you come from? God says, where'd you come from? And the devil goes, I've come from walking to and fro 
already all there. You know why he's walking to and fro all over the earth? He's looking to see so he can make an accusation. The Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion roaming, right? To kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy your walk with Jesus. The devil says. Why? Because he wants to accuse us of something. Here's where we find ourselves. So Jesus has been revealed. It's obvious that Jesus came to save us from our sins. The devil is out there looking everywhere he can to find us some sin to accuse us of and to tempt us into doing it. And there is this second reason that Jesus came. There is another reason Jesus was born. 1 John 3, 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might, listen to that last part, destroy the works of the devil. That he destroy the works of the devil. It is obvious According to this verse, it is obvious that Jesus was born to destroy the works of the devil. Church, here's the message I want to hear this Christmas season, because 2020 has been a year when everything is being thrown at us, right? I mean, everything would possibly can. So you and I need to get all the encouragement that we can get. And the reason of Christmas is because Jesus came to save us from our sin. But more than that, just saving us from our sin, but Christmas is about Jesus being manifested in order to destroy the works of the devil. So not only can we be forgiven, but as the devil is working against us, Jesus is working for us. So the devil's looking for something to accuse you of. But Jesus has come. He was born to destroy what the devil's trying to do to you. That means there's help for you. When you're tempted, Jesus came to help you overcome that temptation. He's there for you. When you fail... I had a friend one time who got saved and his wife said, well, I'm just waiting for him to mess up. And I told her, I said, you know what? It's not not about him messing up. It's about him getting up when he fails. Just before we go, I want to show you one more thing about this word manifested. As Jesus was revealed, he was revealed just like you and me. Let me show you this. He was revealed as flesh and blood. When Jesus was born, he became a person. As a matter of fact, let me just share this with you. I don't want to get into this theologically today. Maybe I'll share a message sometime this Christmas season more about this. But to this day, Jesus is still flesh and blood. Did you know that? He's still man. He's fully God, but he's still man. He's in human form. He is one of us in heaven, and he always will be. That's how far Jesus humbled himself. He's still flesh and blood to this day. Now, here's the deal. So, when it was all said and done, Jesus was resurrected. He's still resurrected as we will be resurrected in the same way, and the way he is is the same way we will be. Let me show you this. Let's take a quick look. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. Let's go all the way back to verse 2. And here's what it says. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, you could put in that word manifested, we shall be what? Like him. So someday, one day you and I will have our turn at being manifested. One day, the clouds will part and Jesus will come and you and I will be revealed in the same way that we will live and exist the same way Jesus had. Why? Because He came to destroy the works of the devil. And because of Christmas. Because Jesus came to save us and destroy the works of the devil. And we will be revealed too as sons and daughters of God. And just like He is victorious over sin and the devil so will you 
be victorious over sin and the devil. Can you say amen to that this morning? Father, we come before you. We thank you because you are such a good God. And we thank you for coming and being with us. We thank you for the Christmas story, the story that tells us about how you came to become one of us and to save us from our sins and to destroy the works of the devil. And we thank you for that today. Go with us as we go. Bless those who are in this room. Bless those who are watching on YouTube and Facebook. Give healing where it is needed. Pour out your spirit upon us and bring us back into your house again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Bye.